All right, let's get started for today. Welcome to lecture seven of Advanced Robotics, Fall 2019. Today we're going to cover uh, two topics. The main topic is going to be constraint optimization. The main topic for the second half of the lecture is going to be constraint optimization, which is the new set of slides. Um, in the first half of the lecture, we're going to continue our coverage of unconstrained optimization, where we still have uh, many important ideas to cover. So let's look at where we were at the end of last lecture. We were doing unconstrained optimization, meaning we had an objective and we want to find the minimum of that objective. And then we saw this example here where we have f of x is half x1 squared plus gamma x2 squared. And if you look at the contours of this function, it looks like ellipses, concentric ellipses. Um, and the choice of gamma will affect to which extent it looks more like concentric circles than well elongated ellipses. What we also saw is that if it's more elongated, the way gradient descent will proceed is actually by hopping back and forth. Because it'll be in this um, landscape where, let's say, I'm facing this, I'm facing forward here, and left and right, it's super steep. And I should go straight forward, but if I'm a little bit off to the left or the right, there'll be a very steep uh, descent, and so I'll be pushed back and forth, left, right, and descend that way rather than go straight down. So that's what's shown on the slides here, and you can make this arbitrarily bad. So for a second, um, uh, second degree objective here, you can do this analytically and compute what the sequence of axes will be. And you can see you can make this arbitrarily slow to converge by making gamma, uh, sending gamma far away from one. If gamma equals one, it's all concentric. You go straight to the optimum. If gamma is much bigger than one, you get it elongated, um, in this case, along the um, the x1 axis, if gamma is close to zero, so also far away from one but close to zero, it'll get elongated in the other direction. And you'll get the same effect. All right, so how might we be able to fix this? Oh, by the way, and this is general, right? This is not just for a second degree polynomial we're trying to optimize. This is true in any function we try to optimize, any number of dimensions, we can look at locally what is the second order approximation of that function? We can look at the shape of the contours. And what we really just need to look at is the eigenvalues of the Hessian, which Hessian is a second order approximation locally, eigenvalues of the Hessian, the largest and the smallest eigenvalue, the ratio of those, that's really what gamma is in what we looked at. Um, that's restricting attention to just two dimensions in your optimization. But those are the two dimensions that together are the worst conditioned uh, if you just look at those two dimensions. And those will be representative of how poorly your optimization will go with regular gradient descent. Now, the more dimensions you have, the higher chance at least you know, two of these dimensions are just off scale from each other, and you start getting this effect. And so for high dimensional problems, it's almost guaranteed that you have poor conditioning, unless you design your problem in a very, very careful way somehow to manage to avoid it. Okay. Let's assume we now have to deal with this. We have a problem that um, is poorly conditioned, yet we still want to solve it efficiently. What we'll see for that is um, something called Newton's method. So let's work through that on the board. So. In gradient descent, we looked at the gradient descent. We looked at the first-order approximation of the function locally, and then found the steepest descent direction, took a step in that direction, and repeated. For Newton's method, we're going to look at the second-order approximation. So actually, we'll need a bit more space. Let me bring this up. So 
in Newton's method, we'll say f, which we want to optimize. We're currently at x. We want to understand what happens when we change x by a delta x. It's approximately equal to f at x plus first order approximation, gradient of f of x transpose delta x. Plus then, the new term is going to be a second order approximation, 1 half delta x transpose. Now, second derivative matrix, the Hessian of f at x times delta x. And now, assuming the second derivative matrix, the Hessian is positive definite, meaning we have locally a bowl-shaped function that is shaped the right way to kind of go to a minimum, then we can actually solve this exactly. We can say, well, if this is our approximation, let's look at this thing, and let's set the gradient. Essentially, we want to find the delta x that minimizes this. So we want to find, we're going to take the derivative. I'll write it maybe this way. Derivative with respect to delta x and see what it is. And we want that to be equal to 0. That's where we have the optimum of the second order approximation. What is it? Well, the first term doesn't depend on delta x. The second one will give us gradient of f at x. And the last one will give us plus Hessian times delta x. We want this to be equal to 0. Well, this tells us delta x equals negative inverse of the second derivative matrix times gradient of f at x. And so this thing here is a closed form solution to tell us where to go if we're considering the second order approximation of the function. So pictorially, what it might look like is we have an actual function, f, maybe it goes like this. Then we have a second order approximation. We're currently here. So maybe our second order approximation looks something like this. And then we'll find the minimum of this thing, which is over here. And so our previous x was, this is our x-axis. Previous iteration x was here. This is our x plus delta x. And then what we'll do is, over here, we'll make a second order approximation to the function and repeat. Question? Oh, should be inverse here. Yes. Thank you. Then once we have x plus delta x, we repeat the process. We do a second order approximation here. Maybe it's this new function. And then the minimum is over here. And that's going to be our next iterate. And we repeat. And it turns out that you know we'll soon see that this in terms of number of iterations required, requires a lot less iterations than a gradient method because it uses a lot more information about the function having access to second derivatives. So let's look at the full algorithm. So we have some starting point x. We pick some tolerance for convergence. We'll compute the Newton step, which is this thing over here. And then we'll compute this lambda square thing. What is this lambda square thing? If we take the Newton step, we fill it into our second order approximation of the function. And in that second order approximation, we check, well, how much is the function expected to change? Not the, not based on having exact access, but based on having access just to the second order approximation. So this is how much the second order approximation predicts we're going to improve by doing our Newton step. Or half of that is, is what it is. Then we check. If the second order approximation doesn't predict much improvement anymore, 
then we call it done. We say, okay, there's not much left to do. Um, if it does still predict a good amount of improvement, then we have a step direction, but now the second order step um, might not be good enough because we might step too far because our approximation might not be perfect. So we'll still run a backtracking line search where we might scale down the step uh, from the original second order approximation step to make sure we make consistent progress in every iteration here. Now, interesting property of Newton's method is a, a fine invariance. What does that mean? At the kind of intuitive level, what it means is if you do a change of coordinates, a linear change of coordinates, then it does not affect how fast your algorithm converges. No, this is very different from what we looked at with the gradient descent method when we had just a two-dimensional problem. And if we changed gamma, that was a, that's effectively rescaling the coordinates. That's a linear transformation on your coordinate system. It would drastically affect how fast it converges. For Newton's method, a linear change of coordinates has no effect on convergence speed. To make this more formal, if you have a coordinate transformation, we originally had a function of, um, let's say, originally we have a function of um, x, and now we're going to replace x with a times y. So y is a inverse x. We could, we now have two functions. Original function f of x, we can run Newton's method on f of x, see what happens, get a sequence of iterates, x0, x1, x2, and so forth. Then we can say, well, let's now consider the new function g of y, which is f of x really, so f of a times y. We call that g of y, and we can run Newton's method in the y space. And we'll get some iterates, y0, y1, y2, and so forth. It turns out that those iterates, y0, y1, y2, will just be a linear transformation, fixed linear transformation away from x0. And so it's the exact same sequence of points that we find in one coordinate system or in the other coordinate system, which is a pretty unique property to have. I recommend you, you try to you know, work through this and see if you can prove this, um, that this property is actually true. Um, after you tried it, check out the slides. We have a proof on the slides that you can uh, then check out, see if you figured it out. Now, let's compare gradient descent with Newton's method. So function shown on top, the contours of the function in dashed lines. And then x0 is over here, and gradient descent is bouncing back and forth, finally finds the optimum. Newton's method just needs a couple of steps and gets there. Now you might wonder, what's that visualization? What's that ellipse that's being shown? Well, we have a second order approximation in Newton's method. That second order approximation has a constant offset, the linear, the gradient term, and then the Hessian, the quadratic term. What's shown here is just the quadratic term. So at x0, the quadratic term looks like this. What it should tell you actually is that at x0, Moving on the long axis of this quadratic is pretty favorable because that's how it's locally shaped. But along the short axis is not as favorable because things are very steep there. You'll start going back up very quickly. And so you see indeed that the update is mostly aligned with the long axis because that's favored. Of course, also the gradient part, which is ignored in that um, ellipse that's shown. And so we move mostly along that long axis, but not entirely. And this process then uh, repeats here. The gradient has the strongest effect to go here. OK, so one thing you should observe is that it takes less steps to get to the optimum. And that's kind of a general property for Newton's method. Bless you. Um, here's a second example, a 100-dimensional problem. On the horizontal axis is the number of iterations we have to do. Left plot is gradient descent. Right plot is Newton's method. Look, gradient descent needs about, to get to 10 to the negative 4, needs about 150 to 200 steps, 10 to the negative 4. 10 to the negative 4 is somewhere here. So for Newton's method, that takes about 5 steps. So 5 steps versus 150 steps. That's how much more effective this is. Now, keep in mind, a Newton step in itself is more expensive because a Newton step requires finding a Hessian. And so the work you do inside a single iterate here shown a horizontal axis k is more computational work than you do in gradient descent. So in practice, there's a trade-off there uh, that you need to consider. But if you just look at the number of iterations, 
with Newton's method, far less iterations needed. A larger version of this example, and what we're going to look at here is this notion of convergence. So with gradient descent, we saw that we had, if we have log scale on the, um, so we saw it here also previous plot, if we have log scale on the vertical axis, iterations on the horizontal axis, gradient descent has this line behavior, which is called linear convergence, whereas Newton's method has this um, parabola here, um, which is quadratic convergence. Even at larger scale, we see this happen, and we actually see something interesting happen um, that initially there's a little bit of linear convergence, which often happens in Newton's method. You're first in a regime where it hasn't fully kicked in yet, and it's behaving a bit more like gradient descent, and then second order really kicks in, and you get your quadratic convergence. Let's go back to our original motivating example. Um, very simple analytical example where we saw, okay, gradient descent is going to struggle if we uh, adversarially choose gamma. And by the way, in high dimensions, one of the gammas will probably be pretty bad. So it's not that, you know, it's a rare case. It's often going to happen. Well, gradient descent goes this way. How will Newton's method go here? Any thoughts? Suggestion is straight to the optimum. Why? It's a quadratic function. And the Newton step will find a step straight, straight to the optimum of the quadratic approximation of the function, which is the exact function. Um, if it's not quadratic, then there might be some backtracking line search, and it might not be the actual optimum. But here, it's going to go straight to the optimum. So that's what it'll look like, one step and done. Two things to think about. One is, not always are our functions ball-shaped. And so if your Hessian has some negative eigenvalues, meaning that it's not a ball-shaped function locally, then um, this Newton step will not necessarily take you to the local minimum based on the quadratic. It will take you to some zero gradient point based on the quadratic, but it might even be a maximum rather than a minimum. So if you're not sure your function is convex locally, you can do a check on the Hessian, see if it is. If it's not, um, you could add the identity matrix. So you just add the identity. If you have add the identity matrix scaled by a large enough positive number, at some point, all the eigenvalues will be positive again. Because when you add the identity matrix, you have your original eigenvalues. You'll just add lambda times i to each one of them. So that's one way um, to do it. Um, and that could resolve those issues. Another, another issue to think about is that Dealing with the full Hessian can be very expensive. If you have a high dimensional space you're optimizing over, maybe you just have, I don't know, a thousand dimensions. It doesn't feel too bad, but now the Hessian is a thousand by a thousand, which is a million entries and becomes uh, quickly unwieldy to deal with, especially if you go to, let's say, a million uh, dimensional space. Now, a million squared is really large to build that matrix in all its entries. So, what can we do instead? Um, Something called quasi-Newton methods, which are essentially trying to do Newton's method but make some approximations. And the idea is that you will never build the actual um, Hessian matrix. You'll just do something that is somewhat second order, but maybe not exactly second order, but at least somewhat close and gets a bunch of the benefits, but maybe not everything, um, while being more efficient for each individual iterate. And then very related is something called natural gradient. And we'll cover that first, and then we'll go to some um, quasi-Newton methods. So actually, before we do natural gradient, any questions about Newton's method? Yes? You mentioned earlier like, uh, if the function is very complicated, it takes you second order to kick in after a certain step, for instance. Mm -hmm. You could. Mm -hmm. You could start gradient descent and then later do Newton's method. Um, you would save a little bit of time because in the early steps you wouldn't um, have to do the Hessian. Um, yeah, it could be done. Uh, if you look in the Boyd and Vandenberger book and you look at the convergence proof of Newton's method, and you'll see that the convergence proof will consist exactly of two parts. The first part is in the linear regime what's happening, and then the second part in the quadratic regime what's happening. And I don't know if the proof has something constructive about knowing which regime you're in, such that you can constructively um, just do gradients for a little bit or not. Um, not sure. Any other questions about Newton's method? Then let's look at natural gradient. Uh, 
which will have some very interesting properties also. So natural gradient is often motivated by the notion that, um, well, we saw for Newton's method, we can be invariant to affine coordinate transformations, which is nice. So details of coordinate system don't matter as much. Um, now, in general, you might say, well, can I be even more invariant to, let's say, can I be invariant to a nonlinear reparameterization of my space I'm optimizing over and have an algorithm that, you know, if I reparameterize in an invertible way, I'll still get the same behavior. It's not immediately clear how to do that in general, but if the optimization you're doing is over a probability distribution, so you have a parameterized probability distribution, so you have something, let's say P X parameterized by theta, and we're now optimizing over theta, not over X. So it's a distribution we're trying to find parameters by theta. For example, a Gaussian distribution over X space with a mean and a variance, and a mean and variance would be sitting inside theta. Um, then you could ask yourself the question, if instead of parameterizing the Gaussian by mean and variance, what if I parameterize that by, maybe by mean and inverse variance? Would I get the same behavior? Or maybe inverse mean and inverse variance, would I get the same behavior out? And the reason you might want be able to hope for this is that, in principle, there is an intrinsic measure of distance in probability distribution space. If you change the parameterization, as long as the distribution is the same distribution, and you have another distribution, you can still measure distance between those distributions in a way that doesn't depend on parameterization. For example, if you look at the KL divergence between um, distribution P over x parameterized by theta and q over x parameterized by maybe some psi. This will be some number measuring distance between the two distributions. If you now parameterize this by some new parameter phi, but it's the same distribution p, then the caliber is not going to change because caliber is not looking at those parameters explicitly. It's just looking at where is the probability mass and does the probability mass overlap a lot or not between those two distributions. Specifically, KL would be, um, if it's discrete, well, well, let's do continuous integral over x, um, p x theta log p x theta over q x comma psi. OK, so this is just one distance metric. We finish any distance metric that you define directly in the probability mass space and not in the parameter space will have this property that reparameterizing your distributions will not change the distance between them. And so in that sense, there is a notion that if we optimize parameters of a distribution, there is an intrinsic distance that hopefully we can work with rather than some distance in parameter space. OK, so now let's take a look at a typical optimization we might do with probability distributions. We might say we maximize over theta some function f of theta, like we've been doing all along. They usually we've been minimizing so far, but maximizing, same thing. And this is going to be max over theta sum over i log probability of data point xi under parameterization theta. So we want to find a parameterization of the distribution that makes data points likely. We want high log probability of each data point, sum that together. It's a maximum likelihood estimator. We'll see more of that in the future. But for now, let's just um, assume this is a given and assume this is what we want. Well, let's take a look. What's the gradient? Gradient of f theta with respect to theta. Let's take it with respect to, let's look at a specific entry p is sum over i, which is same summations over there, 
then gradient of the log is gradient of what's inside the log divided by what's inside the log. So this will be d p x i theta d theta. I just maybe I should not use p because there's a lot of p. I'll call this uh, k entry k d theta k, and then one over p x i theta. Okay, now next thing we need is the Hessian because um, we're going to see what happens uh, in the Hessian. So what's the Hessian? The Hessian will be where we take another derivative of this quantity now with respect to theta L. So we'll do a derivative of this thing with respect to theta L. So gradient We already had respect to theta k, now theta l. What is this? Well, we have a summation over there. That's not going to go away. Then theta appears here and here. So, and it, it's a product, so we'll have two terms. One because of derivative in the first factor and one because of the second factor. So for the first factor, we already have a derivative there, so we'll have a second derivative appear. Second derivative p x i theta with respect to theta l theta k multiplied with of course was with it 1 over p p x i theta plus the other term we need the derivative of the second thing now, multiply it with the first thing, so sum over i, multiplying the first thing, d p x i theta d theta k. Now multiply with derivative of the second thing. Second thing is, well, derivative of one over something is minus one over that thing squared times the derivative of that thing, so we'll have minus one over p x i theta squared times derivative of this thing, which is d p x i theta, and now d theta l. OK, now let's look at how we can uh, rewrite this a little bit. This is equal to the first one we're going to leave untouched. So sum over i, second derivatives, p x i theta respect to theta l theta k and 1 over p x i theta. The second one has a negative sign in front of it. If we take this negative one out, sum over i. And now we're going to actually in some sense, work our way back to what we already did. We'll work in reverse, but we have a reason for that. We're going to say, OK, the, this thing here multiplied with one of these, 1 over pxi theta, is actually back the derivative of the log of pxi theta with respect to theta k. And the second one is the same thing with respect to theta L. If we write out the full Hessian, this is individual entries. We write out the full Hessian. Let's put that over here so I have it all together. The full Hessian second derivative f theta is, well, we'll have the first thing, which is sum over i, second derivatives of p x i theta divided by p x i theta. And interestingly, the second part becomes minus, and they will write the summation again, minus sum over i gradient log p 
x i theta times the same thing transposed. So it's interesting. This thing has second derivatives, and then this thing only has first derivatives, but we'll, we'll multiply them together to get some matrix. Um, what the natural gradient does, it says, well, who knows? I mean, maybe this thing is shaped the wrong way for maximization. It might be like, it might have the wrong sign of eigenvalues and so forth. Also, it has second derivatives in it, which are expensive to compute. You know what? Let's just get rid of this, ignore it, make an approximation, and just consider this part over here. So we're approximating the Hessian with the part of the Hessian that's easier to compute. It's one thing easier to compute, because you just need the gradients, and then you multiply them together in the right way and sum them. Then the second thing is that this is guaranteed to be a function that's shaped like this. Because this is something times its transpose. That's going to be essentially uh, positive always. There's a negative sign up front. So what we get is um, a negative sign quadratic, which looks like this and has a clear optimum, locally at least. And with this approximation, you'll have a clear optimum. So we get this guaranteed, correctly shaped function that we can work with. That's a local approximation. We lose something about the second order approximation, but we, get, we retain a significant part and just use that. Now, what's interesting about this is that we can then, of course, do the same thing we do with um, Newton's methods, similar thing here. We can just say, OK, natural gradient will just be, I'll use this as my approximate Hessian, and then my step will be Hessian inverse times gradient. Um, so I'll say my you know, update theta, um, or I'll, let's see where we have enough space here. I'll say natural gradient is equal to sum over i grad log p x i theta, same thing, transpose, all that sum together. Then we invert this. That's our approximation to Hessian times then the gradient sum over i grad log p x i theta. This has a few interesting properties. Faster to compute than original Hessian. Guaranteed to be negative definite, so shaped the way we want it shaped. Also found to be superior in some experiments than the actual Hessian. And it's invariant to reparameterization. If you reparameterize your distribution, like I said earlier, maybe instead of using as theta your mean and variance, you use mean and inverse variance. Or maybe you use inverse mean and inverse variance or whatever. The sequence of steps you'll go through in your optimization, you'll find the same distribution step after step after step. Um, we, we haven't proven this. I'm just stating uh, this property. So sometimes it's a stronger property than just being invariant to affine reparameterizations. But it's kind of a special case where we have kind of a, a metric that's well defined ahead of time with the probability distribution. The way you would show it would be um, very similar to the way you would show Newton's method is invariant to um, affine reparameterizations. You essentially explicitly introduce the reparameterization, but now it can be nonlinear. And you check for one update step. Does it give you the same update? And if it gives you the same update for one update step, then again, you're good to go for the entire optimization. Any questions about this?
Yes. Is the macro gradient not that formula of that formula? This is the natural gradient. So then what is the one on the left? Which one? Or the one between these blocks? This thing is the approximate Hessian that the, is used in a natural gradient method. So that's why I call it like H tilde. It's not the exact Hessian because this is ignored. It's the approximation of the Hessian that's used. And so this is, the annotation is equal to, well, negative Hessian, approximate Hessian inverse times uh, gradient. Okay, if we have no questions on this, let's um, move to some other approximations to Newton's method. That actually will have a lot of resemblance to the, um, at least two out of three of them will have a lot of resemblance to the natural gradient method. But they won't necessarily be for probability distributions. They can be for anything. So remember that we had the issue in gradient descent that if your contours run, run like this, you'll have a lot of hopping back and forth. And so it takes a long time to get to the optimum. Gradient descent says x becomes x minus alpha delta x f of x, where alpha is determined through a line search. Then we want to avoid this hopping around behavior. So let's think about how we might be able to avoid that. Any thoughts? Yeah. No, I'm actually going in the direction of the gradient. So we want to deviate from where the gradient is, is pointing us because it's kind of too local in some sense. It's using just this current information about the current slope. But ideally, you would know you've been hopping back and forth and maybe use that information to say, well, I shouldn't directly follow it. I should follow a more general trend. And so that's the idea behind uh, grain descent with momentum. The idea there is that rather than following the current gradient directly, we want to define a velocity. The velocity is beta times the previous velocity plus 1 minus beta times the gradient. So initially, the velocity might be 0, and this is just the direction of your gradient. But then over time, this velocity thing will actually average out your gradient. So initially, my gradient might have been this. After that, it's this. Some averaging will actually then point you more sideways rather than going back and forth. And so this velocity vector is the direction which we update. We make x equal to x plus alpha times v. And so what will happen intuitively is that if you have a high dimensional problem and along some coordinates, you hop back and forth a lot. Well, if you hop back and forth, the velocity along those coordinates will cancel out. And along coordinates where you do have a consistent gradient in the same direction, it'll add up and gain momentum in that direction. And it doesn't need to be coordinate aligned. This is generally true independent of the coordinate system. So generally, directions where you consistently want to descend um, will gain momentum and you'll move in that direction. So you'll get something that kind of goes more this way rather than the slow hopping back and forth. 
And it's a bit like we're using second order information. It's not exactly a Hessian, but it's related because we're essentially using the notion that you had a previous gradient and a current gradient. And looking at two gradients is like looking at second order information. Now the Hessian looks at a lot more than just two gradients. It's a much uh, higher dimensional object, but it's a little bit like it once you look at multiple gradients, you're using second order information to do better than you can from just first order information. And this beta um, might be something like 0 0.999 or some, something that tends to, um, well, maybe not this high, but 0 0.9 might be a reasonable choice where you mostly retain the previous velocity, but you add on a little bit the current new information. Now that's one way to try to deal with the notion that it hops back and forth. What's another way to do it? Another way to do it would be to look at the variance in each direction. So RMS prop is grain descent with momentum. RMS prop says, well, if along a certain direction my graded changes a lot, then I cannot trust it as much. So maybe I should downscale it. So I'm going to look at the variance and downscale. When you start thinking about that, it's very similar to what's happening here. If you have this, like measuring variance along certain directions, and if there's a lot of variance along a certain direction, there's an inverse here, you're downscaling the gradient in that direction, whereas keeping it higher in directions where there's not as much uh, variance. So same thing will happen here. We'll now have a S for measuring our uh, variance, and we already had V, so we're using S, um, which is going to be beta times S plus 1 minus beta times the look at the gradient, and we square each individual entry. So this squaring here means you have a vector, and each individual entry gets squared. So it's really measuring the exponentially moving average of the variance in our gradient vector, each individual entry. And then the x update will just be x becomes original x plus alpha times the gradient that we have right now divided by this thing over here. But this thing over here is kind of in gradient squared. So we're going to take the square root of that to make it match up, divided by the square root of s. But just s might be tricky, because maybe, and this component-wise square root, because some entries might be very close to 0. Divided by something close to 0, numerical issues could kick in. So you add some epsilon here to avoid ever dividing by anything too close to 0. And epsilon might be, um, well, it's a really small number. Let me write it this way. 10 to the negative 8, or something like that, is a, is a common choice. Now, these ideas actually have very similar effects in that you're kind of damping out your oscillations here by looking at the averaging. Here you're doing it in a different way. You're just looking at variance explicitly and then damping it out by looking at variance. Here you're doing it in a coordinate-based way, like you're doing a per-coordinate basis. You're measuring variance. Here you're not bound to the coordinate system, so it's coordinate system independent. Um, but they're doing related things, yet somewhat complementary. And so there's another algorithm called Adam, which does both in one algorithm. So in Adam, you're going to have a velocity, which is going to be beta 1 times v plus 1 minus beta 1 times the gradient. You're going to have the Variance is measured, s, so beta 2 s plus 1 minus beta 2, the variance in the gradient that you're measuring by looking at the squared entries. And then x is going to be updated as x plus alpha V, just like we had here, 
But now we're dividing by the square root of s plus epsilon. So that's the kind of just combining the two together. The extra thing that happens is that people tend to, to get the scaling correct across these, divide this by 1 minus beta 1 to the power t, where t is counting your iterations, and this by 1 minus beta 2 to the power t, again, counting your iterations. Because we have an exponentially moving average. It's actually not an average the way I've been writing it over here, this will not be an average. It's not the, not, not exactly the average that, the, the right way. And you, you compensate, compensate for that because you start with zero. If you initialize at zero, you kind of lose something. And this thing compensates for the fact that you started at zero, which is making it not really correct that you averaged in zero. And so that's what that thing is doing, making up for that, and then put it all on the same scale thanks to that and have your update rule. Question, yes? So the square here is the same as the square over here. It's a per component squaring of the gradient entries. So you have a gradient vector, and you square each entry in that gradient vector. So it should be out of this vector, right? Um, or it's only the value of it? It's the gradient. So we have the gradient here, and there is parentheses here around this gradient entity, and then it's squaring. So this is approximately doing something second order, doing something like natural gradient also, except that natural gradient actually doesn't do the square root thing, so there's a funny difference there. Um, and it often will work more effectively than just using grain descent because it'll um, have sufficient second order effect to not suffer from that hopping back and forth that you can get in regular grain descent. Um, let's take a couple minute break here and then after the break let's look at constraint optimization. Because, oh, we didn't prove that. Well, I mean, that's the exercise, and that's why we care. What is, why do we want to prove that? Oh, because why should you represent a Gaussian by mean and covariance, or should you represent it by mean and inverse covariance? What's the right choice? It's not clear. But if your algorithm doesn't care about what you chose and goes through the same optimization routine, you have something that looks at really the distribution, not the parameterization of the distribution. 
the property you care about is the distribution. You don't care about the parameters per se. You care about the yeah, distribution that comes from it. So that's why you prefer to be uh, invariant to re reparameterization of your distribution. What's like an example of a situation where one parameterization is used to uh, um, In common thought, that we'll see sometimes inverse covariance oh, easier to work with, sometimes regular, the regular covariance easier to work with. But that's not so much the point here. The point is that we want to not depend on it. It's not that we think one is better than the other. It's just that we don't want any dependence on it because it's an arbitrary dependence. Uh, that, and we don't want yeah. something arbitrary to affect the quality of our optimization process. All right, let's uh, restart. So far, we've looked at unconstrained optimization. Now let's switch gears to constrained optimization. So we're going to first look at the formulation. Then we're going to look at something called the penalty formulation, a way to solve constrained optimization problems in a very general way. Some special constraint optimization problems can be solved uh, more efficiently than others. They're called convex programs. We'll look at what they are, and also we'll see how they can be used in the inner loop of solving more general problems. And then we'll look at something dual descent uh, as just something I think is really important for you to know about. Um, and we'll make sure we cover that either end of today or beginning of next lecture. So constraint optimization considers this formulation over here. We're minimizing some function um, g0 of x subject to some other functions gr of x small n equal to 0. So think of it like some function gr of x can define contours and the 0 contour you need to lie inside of that. And then h j of x which are other functions have to be equal to 0. So it's not about being inside of something it's essentially you need to be on that function effectively. Um, for example, hjx could represent a, a plane and you need to be on the plane. Or it could be a sinusoid and you need to be on that sinusoid curve, otherwise you're not valid. All right, so this is the problem we want to solve. Let's look at actually can I make a quick request for the people in the back? It's really distracting for me that you're whispering all the time, the two people who are not listening and still talking to each other. Could the two of you either be quiet or leave? It's very distractive. It's hard for me to think through this. Got it? Thanks. OK, so the formulation we want to solve is shown on this slide over here. Um, let's see how we can do this. We'll keep up the problem we're trying to solve, and I'll write up how we're going to solve it with a um, unconstrained optimization problem, which we already know how to do, so then we're all set to proceed. Instead of solving the one on the slide, we're going to solve this. Minimize over x. We still care about g0 of x. Then we still care about the constraints, but we're going to just put them in the objective. So we're going to say plus mu, which is some positive scalar, sum over i, g i of x, positive part. So that means if g i of, I of, x, g I of x is negative, this becomes 0 and does not affect the objective. Original objective, we want this to be negative or zero. So as long as it's negative or zero, this has no effect on the objective. But when gi of x is positive, it stays whatever it is and has an effect on the objective. We're trying to minimize. And so it'll have a bad effect on the objective. And this will be trying to force us to be in the part of the space where this actually is small than or equal to zero. Otherwise, we get penalized. Similarly, for the h 
Okay. We'll take absolute value here because anything away from zero is bad. And so if h of x equals zero has no effect on the objective, but when it's non-zero, we'll penalize. And so what we see here is that if we have an x that satisfies the constraints and we stay just in that space, the constraint satisfied space, we're just optimizing the original objective. And whenever we're not in that space, we'll get penalized for not being in that space. Now, you might wonder, there are some trade-offs here because, I mean, you care about the constraints, you care about the objective, and maybe, you know, you will not satisfy the constraints at the end because you cared more about the objective and not enough about the constraints. So, when we optimize this, we'll call this thing, we'll call this whole thing, we're minimizing over x, f mu of x, and this we call the merit function. And we'll have an outer loop. We'll optimize this thing over here. And then we'll say mu becomes mu times some factor t, t bigger than 1. Maybe t equals 10 or 100 or something. So you start caring more and more and more about the constraints. It turns out that assuming g0 is kind of a, some kind of smooth, reasonably smooth function, um, that if you make mu large enough, you will drive these terms to become 0, because you'll care so much about these that finally they'll become 0, and you'll just be optimizing the original objective you'll find a solution to the constraint optimization problem. You might say, well, mu large enough, why not just start out set mu equal to infinity? Then you're definitely large enough, but computationally that's not really practical. If you put an infinity here, it doesn't really work because the infinity will dominate everything you can't do anything with it. Um, related to that, if you make mu too large in the beginning, your problem might not be that well conditioned. And so your mu will always start somewhat smaller and then scale up over time and in the limit, it'll be large enough such that actually this is satisfied. Assuming there is a solution to the problem, because it's possible you, there's just no way to satisfy those constraints, and you'll keep scaling up your mu, and you keep seeing that things are not satisfied, and you just don't get there. Okay, now the inner optimization of this merit function can be done in many ways. You can do this with gradient descent. We've covered that. You can do this with Newton's method. Or you can do something called a trust region method. Let's take a look. So gradient descent should be clear. We've covered that. We know how to run that. Same for Newton's method. We can do quasi-Newton methods also. You could run whatever, RMS prop, momentum, or uh, atom, or if it lends itself because of, it's a probability distribution involved, maybe you can do a natural gradient. You can do all of that. Um, let's take a look at the trust region version because that's often the most popular one um, in a lot of controls applications, and write that one out. So, hmm. so this will be penalty method with trust region inner loop. So main algorithm that we'll look at. We'll do um, for mu equal 1, let's say. Well, we're, we'll set mu equal 1, and then we'll have a while loop. Um, the outside. And then we'll have min 
over x g0 of x plus mu gi of x positive part sum over all i plus mu sum over all j absolute value of sj of x. This thing over here, we're going to now solve with precision method. What does it mean? We're going to look at min over x, g0, x at x bar, the current point we're at we'll call x bar now. Then we'll linear approximate this gradient respect to x of g0 at x bar transpose x minus x bar plus, and then we'll do the same thing for these terms. So each of these penalty terms, we're going to come up with a local approximation of them. So we'll have mu sum over i positive part of gi at x bar plus the gradient of gi at x bar transpose x minus x bar, positive part of this. And we'll do the same thing for the h's, plus mu sum over j, h j x bar plus gradient of h j at x bar transpose x minus x bar absolute value. So this is not exactly a first order approximation. It's a little more complex than that because there are absolute values here that are retained. There's the positive part here that's retained. Um, so it's a slightly more complex problem than just what your gradient method would look at. But it turns out that this is the kind of problem that is convex, meaning it's an easy to solve problem. And so it's a local approximation that retains the key characteristics of the problem, namely you care about that absolute value, you care about this positive part of the quantity, you don't want to just approximate that with a local line because that'll lose, this is really two lines, a horizontal and a sloped one, you don't want to take just one of them, same thing here, absolute value is two, you don't want to use just one of them because that doesn't allow you to zone in on that point where you need to be. And so we retain those now, you don't want to fully optimize this because it's just a local approximation. So then there'll be a constraint subject to x has to stay close to x bar within some epsilon ball. And again, that's a convex constraint. And this here is called the, this here is the trust region constraint. It's a region in which you trust your objective. Outside of that region, you do not trust your objective. And essentially, You'll solve this, you'll solve this, find a new, this results in a new x. You'll use that x as your x bar to do this again, and you'll keep going around, resolving, resolving, resolving. Just like in Newton's method, you have a quadratic approximation, find, step, repeat. You'll do the same thing over here. Then at some point, this thing will be converged, or close enough to converged. At that point, you'll say, OK, now mu becomes t times mu. So I'll say I scale up mu by a factor 10 or 100, and I repeat. I go around again. And so keep in mind that this is not something we solve just once. We set up this problem. We solve it. We have a new x, which is our new x bar. We solve it again, repeat, repeat, for a fixed mu. So we're working with the same mu for quite a while. Then at some point, we scale up mu and repeat. We haven't yet seen how to efficiently solve this inner problem. Uh, so for now, we're just trusting that that's the case. Yes? So aren't you just adding a constraint again, or is it quasi constraint? Yeah, so we, we have one constraint left now. Instead of many constraints, we have just one constraint, the trust region constraint. That's exactly right. We, we, we have a constraint again all of a sudden, whereas we had gotten rid of it. But it turns out that's an easy constraint to deal with, so we're not worried about it. OK, now I want to take a look in actual quite a bit of detail as to how this shapes up in a full algorithm. <coughs> 
presentation mode. Okay, so what do we have here? This is the algorithm fully spelled out that I wrote on the board, but giving you the details that are required to be able to actually implement this versus just having the high level intuition. So inputs, there is a X bar, which is our starting point for now, but later it'll be updated. Mu is how much we penalize for constraint violation. Epsilon zero is our trust region size. Alpha will, is another high parameter, we'll see later what it does. Beta and then T is how we'll, we'll scale up mu as we come out of this inner process. So the outer thing says while this thing is bigger than delta. What is this thing? It's the constraint violation measure. So if our constraints are violated more than delta, we want to continue because we want to keep working. But we also have a mu max. If at some point our mu is so large, we might just say we bail out, we give up. We're never going to get them all satisfied because otherwise you might get an infinite loop if your problem is not solvable. So this is kind of a bailout here, the mu max, in case your problem is not solvable somehow. Then we'll scale up mu. We'll set our epsilon, our trust region. Then we need to compute those first order approximations. So the derivatives that will come into our inner loop objective. Once we've computed those, we have an objective, which is this thing over here. We're trying to find our next thing. This quantity over here, that's the problem I wrote on the board. That's what we're going to solve. Why is that even living inside a loop? Because maybe our trust region is not the right trust region. Maybe we trust it too far out. So this loop here, this while here, is to make sure we have the right trust region size. Then the loop on the outside is a loop that um, optimizes, this one optimizes F mu. Okay, so we'll solve this thing by calling a convex program solver. Um, this will give us a solution. Then we'll check. What is this thing checking? Remember when we did backtracking line search? We had the approximation to the function, and we checked on the actual function, how much progress did we make relative to the approximation we used to find that step? Same thing happening here. On the left is the actual function, f mu. On the right is bar f mu, which is the approximation we're using with the linearizations in it. The approximation tells us how much progress we expect to make. And then we don't need to make as much progress because it's OK just to be an approximation. The scale factor alpha here, one of the hyperparameters says, yeah, maybe if we just make you know half the progress that we expected from our approximation, we're good. And we're happy with what we did. If that's the case, then we do an update. And then we also grow the trust region. Because the approximation was good, things worked out well for us. Maybe we can do something in a bigger region next time. And then we're done with finding the size of the trust region. We had a good trust region. And we can break out a while three, this one here. And we're back up here, finding a new local approximation and repeating. However, if we didn't make as much progress as we hoped for, we do not update x bar. In fact, we could have made too little progress or even done something bad where things got worse. Either way, we declare it not a success. We don't update. Why is it not successful? Well, we know that locally we should be able to improve. So we should then just shrink our trust region to only trust things more locally. And then we repeat the process. Now, it is possible that as we do this, our trust region keeps shrinking, 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 and we never make the expected progress. If that's the case, your epsilon will go below a certain threshold. And you'll also break out, and you'll say, well, I reached a local region where I cannot find any improvement. That doesn't mean you solve the problem. It can mean that there's just locally no way to make progress. Like there's no way to improve your objective and your constraint violations at the same time, and you're just maybe stuck somewhere. And that can happen. Because if your problem is not convex, and you, solve this kind of, you follow this kind of local procedure of reducing constraint violation, reducing the objective term, 
you might just get stuck somewhere where you can't do any better anymore. So this thing here is all you need to solve constraint optimization problems. With a little caveat, of course, that you need to call this convex program solver. If you don't have access to that, you can replace this with a gradient descent, Newton's method, Atom, RMS prop, and so forth. You just do a few local updates and that's it. But the reason people often like to call the convex program solver is because of the characteristics of the problem. All right, so something very specific here. We try to get constraints satisfied, and if you do anything like gradient descent, anything second order method, you don't tend to capture very well these two terms that we have here, the absolute value and the positive part things, because they're very much not smooth. They have a kink. They have something very locally different from a linear or even quadratic approximation. And so that's why often, if you can, you can you use a convex program solver because it'll exactly deal with that kind of complicated but not too complicated constraint or objective terms that you have here. Okay, any questions about this? Yes. The intuition behind choosing beta, um, different choices of beta will shrink your trust region more quickly or grow it more quickly or then uh, other way around. Um, it's a hyperparameter you play around with. I would say something between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 probably makes a lot of sense. Going too close to zero is probably too aggressive when you grow with one over beta and when you shrink, but in principle you could do it, but it might not converge as quickly. So my natural choice would be 0 0.9. Yes? Is there like a skinny flow to infinity? It might seem that it, this would be slow because how many loops are there, right? There's a loop, let me grab a different color. How many loops are involved? Um, convex program solver, that's internally doing some iterative process or you do gradient descent, same thing. Then you have here compute these first order approximations. That's something you do outside of that. Then there's your scaling of mu. So there's really three loops happening, which is a lot. Nevertheless, this can be really, really fast. I mean, not if you have a you know, billion dimensional problem per se, but if you have problems with regular control type problems, with, I don't know, 10 dimensional, maybe 100 dimensional state space, this can go really, really fast. The big part is that the inner loop is very, very fast, and um, that often you don't need too many outer loop iterations to get there. Now one thing people do at times is when you look carefully at your problem, in the inner loop, if you're really gonna solve a convex program, you might want to look at your original problem and split terms into convex and non-convex terms. For example, the objective could have a convex part and a non-convex part. The inequality constraints, you could have some that are convex and some that are non-convex. The equality constraint, linear versus non-linear. And then in the inner loop, you could retain the convex parts. So this one you retain in your objective directly because you're going to solve a convex program anyway. Why approximate it with that linear approximation from the previous page if you can just keep that part? Similarly, um, when we have constraints, we would explicitly keep them around. So instead of having just a trust region constraint, we'll also have the easy constraints to deal with just retained. For example, box constraints on control inputs. You say between negative one and plus one might as well just retain them in the original format and so forth. So that's a way to bring in as much global information as you can tractably bring into the inner loop to make the inner loop as effective as possible in terms of actually solving the outer loop problem ultimately rather than just you know, doing its own thing and ignoring what really needs to be solved. And so in practice, often there's a game in that regard that you pay attention to. So, the two things we have left here are convex programs and solvers and dual descent. Dual descent is something we can do in 
five minutes, which is what we have left. Come experience and solvers, we cannot. So let's skip ahead to the dual descent. And we'll do the convex program solvers um, next time. In dual descent, what we do, and let me project something related. Uh, actually, we don't, we don't need it. We can just write it up. The penalty formulation gave us min over x g0 of x plus mu sum over i gi of x positive part plus sum over j, absolute value is j of x. In dual descent, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at pretty much the same thing. But instead of having a single mu, which considers all constraints equally strongly, we're going to have a separate variable for every constraint, such that maybe if a constraint is violated more in your objective, you pay more attention to it. And we can actually do this in a justified way. Remember the Lagrangian min over Lagrangian multipliers, max over x. Lagrangian is g0 of x plus sum over i, lambda i, g i of x. Actually, lambda has to be smaller than zero here. Plus mu j, h j, sum over that of x. So let's think about this. In this objective, if a constraint is violated, what will happen? Well, first let's say if the constraints are satisfied, g i of x is smaller than zero, which is a constraint, well, then the lambda, which is trying to work against us, which is to choose a negative value, well, the best thing you can do if gi is negative, and it has to be negative two, is to set equal to zero, because it's trying to make things as small as possible, and negative, negative will be positive, so zero is the best thing it can do. So if the constraint is satisfied, lambda will become zero, and this will disappear. If the constraint is satisfied here, hj of x equals zero, it automatically disappears. The new doesn't even play a role. What if the constraint is violated? If the constraint is violated, if I have gi of x bigger than zero, well, we can take a very negative lambda and make this extremely negative the objective, and that's not what we want. So we're going to be incentivized when we play this game to make sure the constraint is satisfied. Same thing here, if we're not satisfied in the constraint, it's a non-zero number, we can multiply this with any real number new, it'll be able to make it very negative and we end up with a very bad outcome for x. So we see that indeed this min-max problem is the same as the original problem. What does dual descent do? Dual descent iterates You optimize over x for fixed lambda and mu. And then you do a gradient descent step. For lambda and mu. So it's a lot like a penalty method. It's a little different though. In a penalty method, this is replaced by increase mu, increase mu, increase mu. Here it's more subtle. Um, you do a grain step on lambda, lambda or nu, and this will, sometimes nu will want to move in the positive direction, so in the negative direction. And what is the gradient? The gradients are very easy, right? What's the gradient respect to lambda? D 
d lambda i of this objective is just g i of x. So this gradient step is super simple. Entry lambda i gets added to it g i of x. Entry new j gets added to it a j of x. That's it. So this is a very, very cheap update, which will rebalance the emphasis on these different terms. And you can show that this actually is guaranteed to improve in every iterate. So if you fully optimize for x, then you can think of this as really an optimization problem over mu. So for any choice of these, assuming a fully optimized over x, you really have an optimization problem over lambda and mu. And actually, this process is a gradient descent on lambda and mu. And we know that the equilibrium of this game corresponds to the optimum of that. And that's what we're doing here. So very similar to penalty methods and kind of as food for thought, something you could think about as well. Um, what, what would happen if I replace gi of x with the positive part here and replace this with the absolute value. Think about it. We were solving an original optimization problem. We want to hj of x equals 0. Does it have a different solution when I say I want absolute value hj of x equal to 0? No, it has the same solution still. I want a gi of x um, to be negative. Is that any difference from saying? When gi of x is positive, it's violated. When it's negative, I don't care. No, it's essentially, it's, so the two problems have the same solution. Um, and so at that point, they become extremely close to each other. Because now you have ex exactly the same objective, except that the mu, single mu, becomes lambdas and mu's. And you have a different update. Instead of just kind of scaling up by a factor t, you have a gradient step. But actually, these are positive always. So it'll always be an increase. So I'll start behaving extremely similarly, except that things are now have independent parameters for lambda and mu versus a global mu. But you can see that these are actually extremely similar uh, formulations uh, once you look at it this way. OK, that's it for today. See you next week. <laughs>